Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be talking about rapid transit and streetcars in Toronto. I made a video about this over a year ago as part of my Future Of series, but as the channel's production value continues to improve, and as we receive more information, it made sense to do a more comprehensive video as part of our Explained series. This video should act as a single point of reference for the entire rail transit network and planned expansion within Toronto as of 2021. So let's get started. In addition to Toronto's rapid transit lines, this video is also going to do an in-depth look at exciting expansions coming to the streetcar network and the GO Regional Express network within the city. As a disclaimer though, I'm going to cover the entirety of the rapid transit network, including sections passing outside the city, whereas for GO, I'll try to only discuss sections of the network within the city borders, since that network is much more extensive. Though I will be making an exception to talk about Toronto Pearson International Airport since it's such an important destination. This video will be broken into three distinct sections, representing lines and infrastructure which already exist, the stuff which is currently under construction, and the projects which are planned and which I deem likely to be built. I'll be sure to note expected completion times as well. Of course, if you haven't already, click the subscribe button and hit the bell icon so you don't miss my future videos. It helps a lot. Also consider joining the community discord server for great conversations about transit, behind the scenes, and more. Now, let's start by taking a look at the TTC's existing rapid transit lines. These lines allow you to cross the city quickly with consistent frequent service and tightly spaced stations. This means you can get to most of the major destinations in the city on the subway, although it might take a while if you're making a long journey. First off, we have Line 1, which of course is Toronto's primary subway line. Line 1 connects downtown Toronto with the suburbs of North York on the Young Line and Bonn on the Spadina Line along a 38-stop route. In addition, since the line is U-shaped, it covers two separate north-south corridors within the city. Line 1 also provides transfers to all GO lines at Union Station. Line 1 is the most recent line in the city to be extended, with the Toronto York Spadina subway extension, which most notably connected York University, one of the largest in North America, to the subway, while also adding a new interchange with the Berry Line at Downsview Park. Line 1 uses 6 car long, 3 meter wide subway trains with Toronto's unique rail gauge, and 600 volt third rail power. Line 1's trains are fully walkthrough. Next up we have Line 2, which serves the east-west Bloor danforth corridor, Toronto's primary east-west link. Line 2 connects downtown Toronto to the suburbs of Etobicoke and Scarborough along a 31 station route. Line 2 connects to Line 1 at Bloor Young, St. George, and Spadina. Line 2 connects to the regional rail network at Dundas West and Danforth stations. Line 2 uses 6 car long, 3 meter wide subway trains with Toronto's unique rail gauge and 600 volt third rail power. Third, we have Line 3 or the Scarborough RT, which effectively acts as a force transfer extension of Line 2 from Kennedy Station. This relatively short 6 km line connects 6 stations between Kennedy Station and McCowan Station in central Scarborough. The Scarborough RT is on its last legs and will unfortunately be removed in the mid-2020s before the opening of the Line 2 extension, which plans to mostly replace it. Line 3 uses 2.5 meter wide subway trains with standard gauge and 600 volt 4 rail power as well as linear induction motor traction. This is the same technology that you can see on the Vancouver Skytrain and the JFK Airtrain. Next up is Line 4, which is the TTC's least used subway line. This 5-stop line is also 6 kilometers long and connects the Young Subway at Shepherd Young with Don Mill Station in eastern North York. Line 4 uses 4 car long, 3 meter wide subway trains with Toronto's unique rail gauge and 600 volt third rail power. Line 4's trains are also fully walkthrough. Finally, as a bonus, I've added the Queen's Key Tunnel and Queen's Key Station. While some might argue that this is not a true rapid transit route, I think it deserves to be here. This short tunnel runs about half a kilometer, not unlike the distance between other rapid transit stations, and serves a nice, but soggy, underground station which connects Union Station conveniently with office buildings at Queen's Quay, as well as the waterfront and Toronto Island ferries. Better still, this is technically the only subway in Toronto that runs 24 hours a day. Next up, I've got to talk about regional rail in the Toronto context. Toronto currently has five regional rail lines with varying levels of service. These lines, while currently operating less frequently than rapid transit lines, are incredibly fast, so much so that they can sometimes be faster than taking a bus and rapid transit combination, even when frequencies are hourly. 
Unfortunately, Toronto hasn't developed much around its regional rail network yet, so while some major destinations, like Toronto Pearson International Airport, major sports arenas, and the Canadian National Exhibition are accessible, more minor destinations, like major malls, are usually not. Regional rail lines currently operate with 6-12 car Bombardier bi-level trains pulled almost entirely by MPI diesel locomotives. Platform height is low and requires two steps into the train. First up, we have the Lakeshore East Line, with up to 15 minute frequency midday service serving the south and southeastern sections of the city. The Lakeshore East Line offers transfers to the subway and streetcar at Union and Main Street Danforth. Then mirroring the Lakeshore East, we have, well, the Lakeshore West. The Lakeshore West Line also offers up to 15 minute service to the south and southwestern parts of the city. The Lakeshore West Line offers streetcar and subway transfers at Union and streetcar transfers at Exhibition and Long Branch. Following this, we have the Kitchener Line, which serves the western parts of the city and has traditional service with up to an hourly bi-directional frequency, as well as 15-minute airport express service with multiple unit trains. These trains are unique from the rest of the regional rail fleet and are high floor. The Kitchener Line shares a short section of corridor with the Lakeshore West Line leaving Union Station. The Kitchener Line also offers streetcar and subway connections at Union and Bloor Dundas West. On the lower end frequency-wise, we have the Barrie and Stovell lines, which serve the western and northwestern and eastern and northeastern parts of the city respectively. These lines both offer up to hourly bidirectional service. The Barrie line shares a corridor with the Kitchener line until just south of Bloor Dundas West Station, while the Stovell line shares a corridor with the Lakeshore East line until just east of Scarborough Station. These lines have transfers to the subway and streetcar at Union Station, while the Barry Line has subway transfers available at Downsview Park, while the Stovall Line has streetcar and subway transfers at Main Street Danforth, and subway transfers at Kennedy. As another bonus, Toronto does have two commuter-only rail lines, the Richmond Hill Line and the Milton Line. They have very limited utility within the city, but uh, hey, they exist. Now, since I've got all the current rapid transit and regional rail lines out of the way, it's time to talk about streetcars. The streetcar network is incredibly dense and operates much like a bus system, but frequencies are consistently high, especially by North American standards. The vehicles are more comfortable and spacious, and the integration with the subway is very tight, which makes the streetcar a great option for making quick, short trips around Toronto's core or for a last mile connection. The Toronto streetcar network operates exclusively with 30 meter long, 2.5 meter wide, low floor Bombardier Flexities, made custom for the network. They, like much of the subway, operate on the unique Toronto gauge and operate on 600 volt DC overhead power. Some routes operate using trolley poles, but the network is slowly being converted to use pantographs. Streetcars have one cab and hence must use loops to turn around, unlike in Melbourne for example. The current network covers the old city of Toronto with a dense network of major routes along Roncesvalles, Bathurst, Spadina, and Broadview in the north-south direction, as well as major east-west routes along St. Clair, College, Dundas, Queen, King, and Queen's Quay. When you add in the rapid transit and regional rail network on top, you realize that old Toronto is actually incredibly well served by streetcars and rail lines, many of which will have additional stations and services added in the future, as we'll talk about later. This is enabled by the great connectivity between the streetcars and the other rail networks. Pay particular attention to the thicker streetcar lines, which indicate priority operations, as with the King Street Streetcar Project, while the two-tone lines indicate streetcar routes with their own lanes, essentially a tramway. All in all, Toronto currently has 75 or 76 rapid transit stations along four or five lines, with decent backbone coverage across much of the city, as well as 16 regional rail stations across five lines, providing a basic high-speed trunk service and a total of 10 streetcar routes. You'll notice what's missing right now is better frequencies on the regional rail lines, coverage of growing areas around the downtown core, and a more extensive rail network in the suburbs. Next up, I'll cover each network's under construction expansions before discussing planned ones. I think that's valuable because it allows you to get a sense of what the network will definitely look like and then what it might look like. I'm going to mention timelines for projects not based on the official completion dates and rather based on my experience with various projects. Delays have been very common in past Toronto transit construction projects and completion dates are rarely taken at face value. First, I'll discuss four under construction rapid transit and higher order transit lines. I'll also mention the new interchange points, the extensions, and new lines from this point on. First up is the Eglinton Crosstown or TTC Line 5, which will likely open in 2022. This 25 station subway surface line will transform transportation through Midtown Toronto while adding an additional link east into Scarborough. Line 5 will finally connect Line 1's east and west legs north of Bloor with a subway, providing critical redundancy, 
and it will have a ton of new interchange stations with both the other subway lines and regional rail, including at Kennedy, Eglinton, Eglinton West, Caledonia, and Mount Dennis. Unfortunately though, the transfer at Caledonia will not open until about two years after the main line. Worth noting is that the Eglinton line essentially operates as a rapid transit line west of Laird Station and as a tramway east of it. Check out my demystified video on the Eglinton Crosstown for more. Line 5 should open in the next year and a half or so and is at an advanced construction state. Line 5 will operate with trains composed of multiple 30 meter long 2.6 meter wide Bombardier Flexity Freedom trams which are already used in Waterloo on the ION LRT. These trams run on 750 volt DC overhead power and like the streetcars actually feature only one cab. Though the line will not operate using turning loops and will instead always pair some number of trams back to back. Another under construction line is the Finch West LRT or TTC Line 6, which opens in 2024. Line 6 is an 18 station tram line very similar to streetcar lines such as what operates on Spadina. The line will connect northern Etobicoke from Finch West subway station to Humber College. This line will provide relief for one of the city's most congested bus routes as well as provide connections to regional transit operators at Humber College's large bus terminal. And the line will of course be beneficial to students at this Humber College campus, which has been growing significantly in recent years. This project is coming along nicely, but the unnecessary underground terminals at either end could easily delay opening, so I'd suggest this project will likely be finished sometime from 2024 onwards. With that said, construction is certainly much further along since my last video about the future of Toronto Rapid Transit. Make sure to stay tuned to the channel for more construction updates. Line 6 will operate with trains composed of 48 meter long, 2.6 meter wide Alstom Citadus Spirit trams, which are already used in Ottawa on the O train. These trams run on 750 volt DC overhead power and each feature two cabs. Next up, we have the Scarborough subway extension. This extension will replace Line 3, whose number will likely be taken by the Ontario Line, extending Line 2 from Kennedy to Shepherd Avenue via Scarborough Centre. The extension will feature three stops and will be entirely underground. Uniquely for Toronto, this extension will be built with a single bore tunnel carrying both subway tracks. This extension will finally extend the subway network into North Scarborough, an area where transit use is high and there are a lot of great destinations. This project is fairly long and significant, so I think an opening around 2030 can be expected. Early construction, such as creating a TBM launch shaft, has begun, and the project has gone from planned to under construction since my last video. Following that, we'll see a mostly underground western extension of Line 5 from Mount Dennis west along Eglinton to the eastern end of the Mississauga Transitway. This will be a major stop south of Pearson Airport. This will also be the first time the Toronto Rapid Transit Network extends into Mississauga and by extension Peel Region. The line features a mix of tunnels and elevated structures and will operate as a subway as with the central section of Line 5. Perhaps the greatest part of this line is the extension of subway style service to central Etobicoke one of the areas of the city that still remains the furthest from existing rapid transit and which didn't have new higher order transit being constructed. This project, like the Line 2 extension, has moved into the early construction phase since my last video. Now we need to talk about regional rail. Regional rail is very interesting because it almost entirely flies under the radar of the news media, so it may surprise you, if you aren't a regular viewer that is, just how much is going on. Unlike the Rapid Transit Network, the regional rail corridors exist already, so projects are mostly focused on improving the stations, service, and connectivity. Currently, a number of stations on the regional rail network are being upgraded. While not all are getting the same treatment, any station that is getting a major overhaul essentially gets the full Rapid Transit treatment, short of level boarding. <sighs> These stations feature nice bus loops, very nice station buildings, and much improved weather protected platforms with integrated shelters and multiple access points. The corridor seeing the most stations being enhanced is the Stovall Line, with three stations currently undergoing massive reconstructions as covered in my Building Toronto's Regional Rail series. As part of the Eglinton Crosstown project, two new subway regional rail interchange stations are being added between Line 5 and the Kitchener and Barrie Lines at Mount Dennis and Caledonia respectively. These will seriously improve the connectivity between regional rail and rapid transit in the western part of the city. Of course, Kennedy Station on the Stovall Line is also a connection point for the Eglinton Crosstown and is having its transfer improved substantially. With regards to corridor upgrades, extensive work is underway. The Stovall Line is being double tracked and recently had a major level crossing removed at Steeles Avenue. This will enable 15 minute or better service in the future, in combination with another project that's in a much earlier construction stage, the quad tracking on the Lakeshore East Line from Union Station Rail Corridor to Scarborough Junction. 
The Stovall line double tracking project will likely get done in a year or so, and will probably enable up to 30 minute frequency on the line. But higher frequencies will likely not come until the quad tracking of the Lakeshore East Inner Corridor is complete around 2025. On the Barry line, works are also underway to double track the line, but progress isn't moving as quickly, as major works on the Davenport Diamond Grade Separation, a major elevated rail guideway designed to take passenger trains over instead of across a major freight line through Midtown Toronto is a limiting factor. Of course, once complete, the double tracking on the Barry line will allow for an expansion of service to every 15 minutes or better. Finally, there's the Kitchener line. The Kitchener Line is perhaps the furthest along of the non-Lakeshore lines, as quad track already exists along much of the corridor thanks to the major Georgetown South expansion project discussed in this video. Unfortunately, like the Barry Line, a major barrier to service expansion exists in the form of crossing highways 401 and 409, where the corridor narrows to three tracks. Thankfully, the tunnels being built to fix this issue are quite far along, so you can expect 15 minute go service will probably be possible to supplement the existing Airport Express 15 minute service in 2023 or so. Unfortunately, no expansion is currently underway on the streetcar network, though lots is planned, so stay tuned to the next section. When all is said and done, with under construction expansion, Toronto will have 6 or 7 rapid transit lines with 44 additional stations for a total of 119 or 120, with enhanced regional rail service effectively adding another 12 stations to that number for a grand total of 131 or 132. Of course there's a lot more being planned, so let's talk about that. For the final section of the video, I'll discuss the planned projects. I'm going to cover all projects which are being seriously studied, and as a whole, I think we're about 60-70% to 70 likely to see most of the following built. First up, we have the Ontario Line. This line connects Exhibition Go Station on the Lakeshore West Line to Osgood and Queen on Line 1, then to the future East Harbour Go Station, which by the way is not in Hamilton, on the Lakeshore East and Stovo Lines while travelling along the Lakeshore East Corridor. After this, the line goes underground at Pape Avenue to serve Pape Station on Line 2 before continuing north to serve the transit deserts of Flyingdon and Thorncliffe Park on an elevated guideway before terminating at Science Centre Station on Line 5. I think the Relief Line is pretty clearly a project that we needed the province to be involved with, and I think the Ontario Line, the Relief Line's successor, definitely shows this. The Ontario Line is more cost effective and better integrated with the major projects the province is already investing in, the city as well, while also being much more pragmatic about technology than the Relief Line was. The Ontario Line seems like a project that proponents actually believe will be built and that makes it feel much more fleshed out. Of course I'm also a big fan of the automation, overhead power, and platform screen doors. The Ontario Line feels like a hybrid of Sydney Metro, the Canada Line, and the REM, and it's all the better for it. The Ontario line has developed in a lot more detail since the last video I made, and it seems like it's close to final design. Lots of changes and refinements have been made, but the general direction of the project is the same. With construction starting in 2022, I'd expect an opening around 2031. The line will add an additional 10 stations. You'll notice, lines with really good connectivity often don't add that many new stations because they do a lot of work connecting existing ones. The Ontario line will use standard, modern, automated metro trains, with roughly 3 meter train width, 5 car trains, and 1500 volt overhead power. The trains will likely look very similar to those on the Montreal REM, albeit with more fully walkthrough cars. Now there's also another major subway extension being planned right now, and that's the Young Line extension from Finn Station to Richmond Hill Centre, where interchange to the Richmond Hill commuter rail line and Viva BRT services will be available. This extension already makes a ton of sense given the massive numbers of buses using the corridor, but the extension will overload the Young Subway if the Ontario line is not built first, and so this extension is currently waiting for significant work to start on that line before it proceeds with construction. Of course a number of stations have also been cut from the plan, perhaps most notably Cummer in the City of Toronto, but it also feels much closer to reality than earlier iterations. While well, the cost has also increased substantially. I imagine this project, which is fairly deep into planning, will open around 2030. The project also adds 4 more stations. Another extension which isn't too far along in planning, but which feels like very low hanging fruit, is an extension of the Finch West LRT down Highway 27, roughly 3 kilometers, to the future Woodbine GO station. While not quite as interesting as an extension all the way to the airport, such an extension would only be around 3 kilometers long as mentioned before, and would allow for easy transfers to airport trains, making it a pretty good value for money. Such an extension would also add 2 stops with an additional one at Rexdale Boulevard. There's one last extension we're likely to see proceed in the not so distant future, which is an extension of the Eglinton West LRT just a little bit further to Pearson Airport. The under construction extension is set up largely to enable this extension, and it will be the first time the conventional rapid transit network makes it to Pearson. This will be great for providing options for passengers at Pearson to access Midtown, as well as improving connectivity for those already using the subway network outside of downtown, as well as airport employees. 
this extension is likely to add one new stop to the network. Now there is a lot of planned work for the regional rail network, largely by way of further improvements to service, connections to the Ontario line, and many new stations. The regional rail network will be moving to an electrified service in the future, which means that we're likely to see electric locomotives like we see on Amtrak's Northeast Corridor, possibly bimode locomotives as seen on Montreal's EXO network, and most interestingly, electrical multiple units like Caltrain's Stadler KISS bi-levels, a European Stadler Flirt single level, or, if the stars align, something akin to what JR operates on its routes in Tokyo. The Lakeshore West Line already features up to 15 minute service, and is unlikely to see too many radical changes besides its electrification and potential electrical multiple unit service. There will likely be even more frequent service and an expansion of the window for which the frequent service lasts. A major upgrade to Mimiko Station is underway to integrate it with a high density transit oriented development, and a future station at Park Lawn to serve the massive amount of high rises appearing at Humber Bay Shores, and a redeveloped Christie site which would likely see a streetcar connection. The Kitchener Line will see more service improvements than the Lakeshore West Line, with 15 minute or better electrified service and potential electrical multiple unit service arriving. There are also a number of new stations to be added, including King Liberty in Liberty Village, St. Clair Old Weston, which would see a streetcar connection, and Woodbine Go, a major new hub adjacent to Woodbine Racetrack, which would become a satellite station for Pearson Airport, allowing riders on the Kitchener Line and an eventually extended 506, I mean Line 6, uh, I mean Finch West Line, to access the airport, which is a major employment zone. Also of note, a tunneled connection between Bloor and Dundas West stations is supposed to be constructed in the next few years, and this would finally drastically improve that transfer and definitely justify unifying the station names. The Berry Line, like the Kitchener Line, will see 15 minute electrified service and it will also likely see a few new stations. These include Spadina, which really should not be a Berry Line only station, as discussed in a video at the top right, which would provide a streetcar connection, and Bloor Lansdowne, which would enable a transfer from the Berry Line to Line 2 of the subway, one stop east of the interchange with the Kitchener Line at Bloor Dundas West. Last but not least, I'll talk about the Lakeshore East and Stovall Lines. These lines as mentioned before have their destinies tied together by the fairly long interline section. Of course both lines should get 15 minute or better electric train service, which is a big improvement for the Stovall Line, and a smaller one for the Lakeshore East Line. Keeping that in mind, the stations where these lines both stop will be getting subway-like frequency from both lines. Of course, both lines are also going to see a major stop at the East Harbour Satellite CBD, with a streetcar and Ontario line transfer and lots of destinations in the vicinity. On the Stova line itself, we're also likely to see new stops at Finch Kennedy and Lawrence Kennedy, the latter of which will not be built until the SRT is decommissioned thanks to space constraints. The Stova line is also set to see a number of new additional grade separations for its north-south leg parallel to Kennedy Road to improve reliability and safety. The Stova line is also supposed to get up to 7 minute service, thanks to the waning influence of the Smart Track plan and the pretty great corridor location through Scarborough. Now, for Toronto's future streetcar lines, which are currently being planned primarily by the city, note that since the streetcar routings are flexible, I'm avoiding mentioning particular services and will be focusing on the actual infrastructure, though I will suggest some possible linkages. First, the current Queen's Key line will be reconfigured at Queen's Key, allowing for a streetcar extension east along Queen's Key serving the rapidly developing Eastern Harbour Front. I talked about this plan, which will also include major rebuilds of Union and Queen's Key streetcar stations in a video last week. This line stops at Cherry, where it meets an extended Cherry streetcar line. This plan, known as the Waterfront East LRT, is fairly far into planning. Once that project is complete, another extension of the Cherry streetcar line heading south into the newly revitalized and redeveloped Portlands district will be built. This would connect the King and potentially Queen streetcar routes with the Harbourfront and the Portlands. Also in the Portlands, a new east-west route will be built along Commissioner Street, connecting the current streetcar line and maintenance facility at Leslie and Commissioner's to the Cherry Street line, while serving the east-west axis of a redeveloped Portlands district. This would provide more network redundancy and better connectivity to the Portlands and waterfront. Another new north-south line will connect the current tracks along Broadview Avenue to the East Harbour development along with its new GO and Ontario line station before terminating on Commissioner Street in the Portlands. This improves the intermodal connections on the eastern half of the streetcar network which will be lagging behind those of the western half. There are also plans to connect the Harbourfront West streetcar to the Queen Streetcar's Lakeshore segment to create a Waterfront West LRT. This project seems to be on hold while Exhibition Station is figured out, but will involve a roughly 800 meter connection between the Exhibition Station streetcar loop and the Dufferin Gate loop. This would allow streetcar service all the way from the eastern waterfront to areas like Humber Bay Shores. All in all, these new lines should feature dedicated lanes and will build off of the success of the Harbourfront streetcar route while further developing the Portlands and Harbourfront as transit oriented communities. 
If everything under intensive planning is built, Toronto will have 7 or 8 rapid transit lines, extensive regional express rail service, and 12 or 13 streetcar lines. From the current 75 or 76 rapid transit stations, a total of 68 will be added that brings the total all the way to 143 or 144, well into the triple digits. These numbers make Toronto finally feel like a world city, and while there is still much to do, in the 905 in particular, Toronto will easily be trading blows with New York and Mexico City for the best network in North America, and will no longer feel so far off from systems internationally. Thanks for watching. Of course, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to leave a comment down below telling us what project you're most excited about, and as always, follow us on Instagram and Twitter for the latest. Have a good one.